Hi, I'm Masaba Gupta. Each week on How I Masaba from Luminary, I talk to one incredible woman about how they do well them. These are the inspirational mindsets, necessary daily practices, and only funny in hindsight experiences that have defined and continue to drive our culture's greatest. When I was growing up and the world was a lot simpler than what it is today, you know, you didn't have access to all the content in the world. The thing that was my window to the world were books, plain old simple paperbacks. They were my constant companions to school, to tennis class, out of town trips, everywhere. And they started to build and mold my worldview. I recently read somewhere that writers are the engineers of our society. And it hit me hard. Now, when I look back, I can safely say that if it were not for the books and the writers I read as a child, I wouldn't be the same person today. My guest today has worked with writers all her life. The story of Indian publishing, Indian writers, and Indian books is incomplete without her story. Over the years, she has brought to our attention some of the most exciting writing of our times. From Arundhati Roy to William Dalrymple, from Perumal Murugan to Manu S. Pillai. Today, I'm speaking to the legendary publisher, Chiki Sarkar. Wonderful, Chiki. Thank you so much for doing this. It's an absolute pleasure, honor to have you on the show. Thank you. And likewise, I'm so thrilled, Masaba. I'm a big fan. I know you've spoken extensively about your journey from your prestigious position at Random House into entrepreneurship. But honestly, I was a bit more intrigued by another part of your journey. Now, conventional wisdom states that you go off on your own to be more independent, right? I mean, I did that too. Typically, you just want to sort of hold the horses on your own, in your own way. And then every time you raise funds, you lose some of that independence and that control. Now, Juggernaut raised this first round relatively quickly. And of course, more recently, you announced a very cool strategic deal with Bharti Etel. Tell me, I want to talk to you about the ebbs and flows in terms of how you personally felt through this journey. Did you truly feel like you had more independence when you started out? Did the accountability of investors get to you? Did you feel like you're answerable a lot more than you were earlier? You know, Jagannath is a very particular business, Masaba. Uh, the world of books uh, is is very distinct from uh, the kind of fundraising you might have, say, for makeup. So uh, one of the things I've often felt with investors is that, uh, you know, the, what, what do I need to be making? I need to be making hits. And I need to be making these hits so that people purchase these books, whether on the app or on uh, in in print. And that is what makes my income and that is what makes my uh, reputation. But let's talk about your decision making for a second. You've always had an eye for talent and you know what works, what doesn't work. But now in hindsight, can you see some of the choices that you made through those stages of your career? Do you think they differ now depending on where you were? In the sense, back then you needed to make certain decisions. Now you need to make them differently. Do you think you were taking many more risks at Random House or with Juggernaut? What do you feel about that? So look, you know, what is a publisher's job? It's not unlike a film producer's job. Uh, it's you pick books that, for two reasons. One is you think it'll work, that there'll be people who will buy that book, right? The other is that you love that book. You're like, fuck, I love it. I have to have it. And then, of course, the fantastic thing that sometimes happens and not always is when the thing that you love is the thing that everyone wants. And so your passion and the commerce marry, right? So it can sometimes marry, it sometimes doesn't have to marry. Now, but but in the end, I have to primarily make books that work. And that, uh, that push or that pressure to make books that work uh, has been a pressure all through my life. And the thing that I think that has... Uh, been my the so if you had to say to me what has driven your career right I would say the thing that has driven my career all my life uh you know is how do people read and how can I get more people to read that is what that's why I do what I do right and and when you say how do I get more people to read you are you do it you answer it by many many ways you say oh maybe it's by publishing x or it's by marketing y but it's the driving question and it was my it was a question that drove me in my uh, Random House days. It's the question that drove me while I was publisher of Penguin. And it's the question that drives me today. So in that sense, the cheeky of Random House and the cheeky of Jaconaut is really the same person. 
uh, but the cheeky of Jagnaut has that same impulse, asks the same question with more experience and more confidence and with more ambition. The ambition that comes out of experience and confidence, right? I feel um, uh, so, so it is no different, right? I mean, and that has been my driving thing. And so if you look at sort of the books that have defined my career, you know, I remember when I was, when I became editor-in-chief in Random House, I was pretty young, I was 28, and I'd just come from London, and I was this very serious girl, very artsy. I, I didn't even have a TV in my house. I was totally disinterested in popular culture. I read very serious books. And uh, the people at Random House UK said, you know, Chiki, you've got to grow this business and you've got to make some money. And I was like, fuck, I can't just publish these elegant novels. And I, yeah. there are two books that I'm most, in a way, pub, proud of publishing in my time at Random House. I, there are many amazing novels I've published. For example, the Booker Prize winner, Shehan Karunatilaka, his first book, that was like a big highlight. But two that I loved because it took me out of my comfort zone. Because remember, I was this girl who was this bookish girl who read serious novels. And I did, um, I went to IIM Ahmedabad and I said to them, look, you know what? Harvard Business School has an entire series of books called HBS Books. IIM Ahmedabad should also have it. Why don't you have your own list of books and I will do it for you. And the yeah. dean was like this super cool guy because I, I, he looked at me and he said, fine, let's do it. And we did this series. And the second is, I, I, you know, I, read, I was on a flight to Calcutta to visit my parents and I had this People magazine with me and they had done a short piece on the woman who made Karina Kapoor into size zero, uh, who is this, uh, you yes, know, the dietitian. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's, you know, I better get her diet book. And I called her some friends in Bombay and I said, listen, do you know who she is? Can I have a number? And I was on the phone with her in a week and we had this book and it became... And is to date the book, Don't Lose Your Mind, Lose Your Weight, is India's top-selling diet book of all time. And why I'm very proud of those two books uh, is that actually, you know, I was naturally the girl who would have published Shyam Tilaka or writers like Daniel Moinuddin or Chumpa Lahiri. And because I now ran this business and I had to bring in the money, I, I ended up publishing these books that I never normally would have done, business books, diet books. And it forced me out of my comfort zone uh, and and so when I look back on that period, I think, wow, you know, it's when you're forced out of your comfort zone, you discover all these things about yourself. You th I realized I had this side to me that could make hits or I had this side to me that could hustle. And I had this side to me that uh, could, could, ha could have a relationship with uh, somebody about uh, diet books or could talk to a business professor and talk about uh, uh, some kind of thing around management policies and and I discovered that my brain was capable of doing all these different things. And it gave me a kind of confidence and pride because I, I it, it took me out of the path that I had imagined I would always be on and widen it. And that is how, you know, I think about sort of my, if, if I again had to think about sort of my career, I'd say this, that I've been able to do both those things. I've been able to do very serious books and publish Nobel Prize winners, but I've also done pregnancy books and diet books and business yeah. books and all kinds of things. And I love that I've been able to do all of it. And But it, it's been driven by this, what will people read and how can I get people to read more? And maybe they won't read the very serious books I do, but they might read this. It's amazing you say that because you're somebody who's not being, well, you're not a snob about what you want to publish. You're like, hey, man, I, I like... I like meaningful books, but I also have to run a business and that's what it is. But what I want to ask you is what is what is the current state of mind of of a reader? What is happening in today's generation? So, you know, there, there's different kinds of readers, Masaba, today. All right. Uh, and I'll tell you a couple of amazing stories. So I work with an amazing self-help writer called Ankur Wariku, who wrote a book called Do Epic Yes, Check. of course. And this is the highest selling Indian book of last year. And that's a story that I tell people when I meet them about Ankur. You know, last year, uh, before we published the book, we put the book on what's called pre-order, which is that you can order it in advance and then when it's published, people get it immediately. And on okay. pre-order, the book went to number one on Amazon, right? So people were pre-ordering before it was published and it was going crazy. And I had come to Bombay to meet some girlfriends and I was sitting in the Old Pedro restaurant and I had an early right. copy of the book and you know I put it on the table and I said this book is going to go crazy and 
the waiter who served me looked at the book and looked at me and said, I pre-ordered this. And I thought, that's amazing. I have never, ever, ever, ever thought that I would publish a book that the waiter in the restaurant would say he had bought. And it was a very big moment for me because I felt really proud, right? Because that's what you want. You want your books to go as wide as possible. You want everyone to read it. So when you say to me, who is this new Indian reader and what are they reading? On one hand, I feel that there's a new world of Indian writers who are reaching out to a very wide range of people. They're reaching out to people who work in Opedro as the waiter, you know? Yeah. And that's amazing. Yeah. And like the Opedro waiter, you know, I he's able to read, he, he purchased an English book, Masaba, right? He's not reading it in English. Mm. He's, he's reading it in English and he wanted it so much that he pre-ordered it before it was even published, right? Because he loves Ankur. So, so there's, I think, a world which... Uh, it's a, it's a, that there's certain kinds of writers, maybe because they're big people. You know, Ashneel Grover now has a book that's a massive hit. And I am sure the kind of people who are reading Ashneel Grover are also like that. For example, my husband's trainer uh, in the right. gym is a massive Ashneel Grover fan, right? So he's probably bought this book. So suddenly there's a world uh, uh, in India that it could be the gym trainer, the, the restaurant waiter. Who are all who are reading now? They are not reading the the most serious of books, not books necessarily written by a Nobel Prize winner or a Booker Prize winner, but they are reading and they are thinking and they are using it to motivate themselves and improve themselves. Right. On the other hand, what's also happening is uh, you you are seeing lots of uh, people who want to read, particularly nonfiction about India. Like I feel like. Uh, yeah. Another thing that I see is like people who want to read their own histories, you know, like so we work with writers like Manu Pillai, who's a young guy from Kerala, who's a historian, whose books just sell by the truckloads. And I think it's, you know, and he writes about some largely South Indian history, right, from Kerala, where he's from, but also from the Deccan and all of it. And I think the people who read him while they're history buffs, they're also, you are beginning to see a person in Kerala saying, I want to read history, the, the stories of my state or my region. Okay. And so I feel like that too is happening, that there is a, so there's all kinds of new kinds of readers. So there's a new kind of reader that say, I want to learn about my history and about my, about what's around me. And then there's a guy who typically would not have read 10 years ago who's saying, I want to learn about investment or I want to learn how to get ahead in life and I want to read a book. Um, and so there's, so so that's what I feel about who is India's readers, that there was always a serious reader, but now there are new, there are, there are new, I think there are lots of people who are ambitious about learning in different kinds of yeah. ways and they're picking up books. No, but that's interesting because it, to my knowledge, uh, what I see around me, I thought that people's attention span is just shrinking when it comes to reading. But I'm happy to hear you say this. And I think I think people now love that, oh, you know, um, uh, the 5 a.m. club and <laughs> like you said, do epic shit. They love it. They want to know how they can live better lives. They know how they can be better entrepreneurs or how they can start of being entrepreneurs. So that's a great new new zone. But you know, I was talking to Faye D'Souza, who was on the show fairly early on. And she was telling me something uh, that she was worried about bright young minds not wanting to be journalists anymore because the career is just not as appealing as it used to be. Do you feel that some of the best young writers will choose to pursue other careers or maybe even writing through other newer mediums? So you know, Masaba, the world of books, has never been a high stakes world, right? Like, so if you know, even three, Charles Dickens, when he was writing, you would need yeah. to be a very success uh, through the history of writing. There was rarely a time when writing alone ever made money for you, right? Uh, you always struggled, right? The struggling writer has that idea has existed from the time writing has existed, okay? So the person who wants to write a book, writes a book against all odds, against their reason and against logic, right? They don't, and they've done it all their lives. They've never write, written to make money as such. They know yeah. that writing is never going to bring them that much money. Some of them become famous. A lot of them remain totally unknown and unsuccessful. So what that means is because it's always been that, right? Uh, it, 
there's never been a place to, for decline. So, you know, like if you, you, you wrote books because it's, there was, it was the thing you wanted to do no matter what, right? It was not because yeah. it was, it, it used to be a trendy thing to do or it was a thing that made you money and now it doesn't. And so you're not doing it anymore. So, so, so what I mean is the people who want to write at any time in history are just going to write anyway. You know, there's not going to be, they, and, and they write knowing that almost certainly it will not work. Or very few people will write to read their book. And some, because you remember in, in the world of publishing, you know, it's like 2% of your books turn into hits, the rest don't, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. so that, it's from William Shakespeare's time, right? Like I was listening to a, 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 a talk at Jaipur Lit Fest about this poet called John Dunn, who's one of the great poets of uh, sort of the 16th century or so in, in, in Britain. He's supposed to be the great sort of uh, poet, love poet of, of, of sort of classical early modern Britain. And this guy, if you heard about his life struggling, no money, all his children die, his wife dies. In the, in the end, he has to become a priest to make ma ends meet. And now he's like this famous writer, right? So we've always heard of these stories, right? So why did John Dunn write? Because his heart told him, I can't not write. My heart will stop working if I don't write, you know. And that's the same for today. I mean, even you take someone like Chetan Bhagat, who was a successful banker before he became a writer. Correct, and and, correct, and correct. In, in the early days when he was writing books, of course, his banking salary would have been far bigger than his writing uh, income, right? So why did Chetan Bhagat decide to be a writer? It's an irrational thing. If he had been fully rational, he would have said, no, man, I'm going to go on with my banking career. It's going to give me big bucks. I, I'll be able to look after my family. Why am I going to write novels, right? So any yeah. writer, when they start to write, they write for totally irrational reasons, which is my heart wants to write. Whether it's a Chetan Bhagat or a William Shakespeare, same logic. They can't not write. So, you know, because of that and not money, there's never been a logical reason to write. If you're going to be logical about writing, you won't write. You'll say, well, it's just not worth the hassle. That fall has never happened. There's never been a disappointment by writers saying that I won't write all of that. And all, most writers, unless they are very famous, have an alternative career. They, whether they yeah. teach uh, creative writing in a university, whether some of them work in other jobs, uh, you know, they only end up being full-time writers when... They, when they when their books start doing well enough that it can become their income. So I don't feel that, in fact, so I would say, turn it around from what Faye has said, that I actually now find, particularly when I, like the examples of history and stuff that I've said, more, I find that there's more people who want to, who come to me and say, I'm going to write a great work of history, or I want to write a, a, a non-fiction project about A or B or through Z, you know, it was... I, I think there's more people who actually want to write today than there want. No, no, because yeah, actually, that's, you know, that's the, great. Yeah. and they mm. also feel that the book can potentially turn into a TV thing. So that is also happening, yeah. right? So, he, like, you know, I had a historian, young guy, he's under 30, and he's written a book on, on the Deccan, and Rana Dagubati has bought the rights for this book, right? And what he is, right. what the rights, the the amount that Rana Dagobati is paid, uh, Ani Roth, is far bigger than any advance we've paid him. And so, you know, in mm. the future, what may happen is there's a film deal and there's a book. And the book is his way of putting all his research and all his thinking together coherently. But then the book turns into something that's like in the world of film or TV. And that's what brings him his income. Uh, so actually, because this is now more and more possible, it's actually more possible for someone like Ali Ruth, who is a 30-year-old boy. He doesn't have a job at the moment, Masawa. He simply has a column wow. that makes him enough money to get by, not a lot. He And then the idea is that he'll write a book. And then if those books turn into TV shows, they bring in a large amount of income. And that is how he'll share his life. So this is possible today in a way that, it, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and all of that have made it possible to do this yeah. in a way that it wasn't before. So our, our, our world, I think it's more fertile now than it's ever been. Mm, because they can become, I mean, they can become best-selling writers and also have, you know, I mean, Chetan Bhagat also had the two states connection with the film that got made. You're right, you know, that's that's also sort of the starting point. But, but tell me, um, there's also the whole conversation around AI, right? I know that 
I follow the art community very closely and there is outrage around AI and the fact that there is some plagiarizing that's happening there with artist style. Do you think that could ever happen with books? Do you think AI could replace writers? I mean, you know, I think AI would do certain things that could potentially replace certain aspects of a writing writer's work. Would it replace all of it? I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I really have to say I can't say anything categorical about it. I, I, you know, I really feel like any new technology totally supplants an old technology. They, they supplant it yeah. in some ways, and then the old thing—it's sort of like an adjustment, right? Uh, and and what uh, what AI will do, and what its real uses will be, I, I just, I, I'm watching it, fascinated, like everyone else, but I, I just don't. Yeah. But I don't feel threatened by it. If you know, I I've never understood uh, why yeah. new technology and ideas. You know, there's often a feeling like people often say, "Oh, you know, like there's always a thing that says, oh, old ideas are threatened by the new ideas somehow." And the and I feel like no, the new idea. I mean, it'll in the end, people are cre are the people who hold AI, and I think that unusual, interesting, weird things will happen. I don't think it's going to be all bad. Yeah, and I think what happens is you have some people who adopt it, some people who, you know, take to it like water, but like fish to water, but some people who are just not interested, you know, they're just like, we're very happy with our, I know a lot of people, by the way, who just don't want to read off a Kindle or a device. They want to read a book. They like the smell of books. They like how it feels in their hands. So there's always two sides to everything, exactly. to every innovation as well. Really interesting. So I'll give an example. You know, when I started Jagannath, as you know, Jagannath is an app as well as we publish books. And people were very skeptical of the app. And, you know, people used to say to me in this very uh, bitchy, passive aggressive way, oh, but, you know, I read just the print book. There's nothing like a printed book, <laughs> the smell of ink. And, you know, at first I used to feel a little, I knew what they were trying to do. They were trying to like puncture my balloon and I used to feel a bit hurt. And then I realized, but this is an advantage for me because what it means is that both these sides won't cannibalize each other. The world of the digital readers will grow but because there's going to be a world that says, oh, I only read print books, they're never going to go to this world, which means I can grow both the worlds and they won't eat yeah. each other up. And this is an opportunity. It's not a problem. And so this is how I, I see the AI. I mean, I haven't thought through AI and actually ever played with it enough to be say, able to say anything intelligent. But the, the expo the in whatever experience I've had in dealing with new technology, I can't believe that. AI will fully supplant it, but it'll do certain things better than the old thing could do. And then the old thing will turn around and change itself just a little bit. And then AI will be used for something or the other. And then it'll find its way in this new river. These two screens will flow together, you know, sometimes mixing yeah. each other, sometimes not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, on that note, we're going to move to something lighter where I have a few questions that I just have to know now that I have you. And you can make them as short or as elaborate as you like. All right, what is the book you go back to often for comfort? Don't laugh, but it's War and Peace. It's my favorite book. And I, yeah, I've first, so I first read War and Peace at 13 and I read it every few years. Uh, and it's sort of become, you know, the reason I read it every few years is in a way it also allows, because I remember what I felt about it when I last read it, and then I always feel differently about that book every few years, and in a way it's like a mirror to my life, it's my mirror for myself, like to show how much I've changed, and I love War and Peace because it has everything, you know, it has, for example, Tolstoy does, young girls going to parties for the first time better than any writer. I mean... Anyone else. Yeah, you know, like, so when I was 13, I, I found all the war bits very boring, right? But I used to read yeah. Hills and Poons and stuff. And in, and, and in one piece, there's these wonderful scenes of like a 70-year-old and she's going to her first ball. And she's all dressed up and she goes to this ball and she's wondering, is anyone ever going to dance with me? Am I going to be ignored? I feel so shy. And, and it's so sweet. He's so good at tenderness and romance and beauty and glamour and all of that. And at the same time, of course, you know, when, when I, three years later when I read it, I was sort of a little bit more open to the war scenes and the more serious things. But I love the breadth and the humanity of Tolstoy where he can be both silly at, and then serious um, and fun in the, in the same, same breath. breath. And the mm. same breath and in the same book. And I feel like it has all of life and 
it remains my favorite book. So it's the one I go back to time and time again. And, you know, it takes a while for me to read it. Also, it's like watching like a big soap opera. You read it in parts. And, yeah. and often with books, like I find that, you know, it takes me a while to get back into it. And so maybe like the first few days, I'm a little bit like uh, antsy when I'm reading it. And then I slip into it and it's like I slipped into like the most cozy, comfortable like bed with the cozy duvet and I'm just in it. And then I never want it to end. And who are some of the exciting young authors you would advise people to keep an eye on currently? Uh, you know, uh, the the writers that I've been very intrigued and impressed by in uh, recent years is a very trendy writer called Sadie Rooney, uh, who is a very, very fashionable. She writes these uh, she's written sort of three novels, which, you know, some have become big TV shows, etc. And they're about young people talking uh, uh, about relationships and about politics and about falling in love and about friendships. And I actually find okay. her really, because I think that she's more than just a cool, hip millennial writer. I think that she writes about politics and what the novel should be in really interesting ways. And she's a career that I would follow and see where she goes. Out of all the work you've put out into the world, which one did you enjoy working on the most in terms of the process, even if it's not something that's been successful? You know, um, in the end, I think uh, the process is your relationship with the writers. Like with some, ed your writers, you know, editing is very hard. Like right now I'm editing somebody who just, he hates every cut I'm making, right? And so we go back and forth and it's like pulling teeth and, you know, we'll see what happens. And I'd say Twinkle Khanna of all my authors, uh, you know, I love working with her. Uh, and one of the reasons I love working with her is I'm brutally frank with her. Like, I just, I, I, you know what? I absolutely don't even ever speak to her with one word of diplomacy and tact. I, 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 you know, there's something about my relationship with her. There is complete trust on both sides. And because there is so much... Um, because I don't have to, you know, as a publisher, as an editor, you do have to watch how, watch how you talk to your writers, right? You can't say this sucks or this is super boring because it will hurt them. Yeah. So you have to make those points in a nice, tactful, thoughtful way, right? Like my boss, Alexandra, once used to say to me, you know, the way to edit is you have to make, you know, you have to pay three or four compliments and then you put one criticism in the middle, you know? And, and that's how all of us work with our authors. But with Twinkle, I really don't. It's collaborative. And she makes a lot of fun of me. And, uh, you know, we are very, we're kind of oddly similar people. And yet we are totally different. We have many, many, we're more different than similar, but there we have these few similar things. So I don't know why the working, it works very well. There's a place of total trust. So I, I think probably she's the writer who, and I, I talk to her like every other day. Like today I spoke to her for okay. half an hour. So, you know, it's just like a long, it feels like a relationship where we're in touch about all kinds of things and, Hmm. Nice. Do you also keep a list of manuscripts that you passed on that you wish you could change your mind about? Look, there are a lot of hit books that I've passed on. I don't regret them, but I should. I mean, for example, White Tiger, which won the book of, and then yes. it became a great hit. It's a book I said no to, by the way. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm going to stand firm on is uh, an editor in the end is only their taste. It's only their gut. And 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 this and so you know in the end, the Chiki Sarkar list of books or the Jagannath list of books is the books that we have bet on, right? And your dash, your and 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 the shape that you are is defined not just by the things you're saying yes to, but the things you're saying no to. Uh, and mm -hmm. and that's what defines you. And that's by being any creative thing, right? It could be even the the fashion collection you put out, right? Like. It, the, why is it that on a certain season your clothes look like X and not look like Y? Because you've decided not to do A, B, C, D, but to do, do, do F, right? And so there are many, yeah. many books I turn down uh, because I don't see it or I don't see myself doing it or I just don't get it or I don't know how I would do it with any intelligence. And uh, I, White Tiger being the most famous one that I can remember. Uh, that I, And I feel like, well, that's what it is. You have... You have your own particular hits and you all have your own misses, but there's no one who ever gets it 100% right. And that's what yeah, it is. Yeah. And last question, without the pressure of any business agendas, what would be your dream project? Things that I love that I don't do enough of. I love cookbooks, you know. 
Uh, and um, I would probably never really do cookbooks in India because they take too much time, they cost too much money, they don't send as much. But but I began my career doing cookbooks. They were the first books I edited when I worked in London. And I love cooking and I love food. Uh, and I would love to do, you know, sort of slightly like big art projects. I remember once writing to the artist Anish Kapoor and saying to him, would you illustrate the Rig Veda for me? Like if I did an illustrated Rig Veda with Anish Kapoor. Uh, you know, so I often have these sort of slightly high production arts ideas that I never do. And that I think I never do just because of time and cost and effort. And those are the books I write. Lovely. Chicky, thank you so much for lending your voice, your mind and everything that you said, I think is really going to make me think for many, many days to come. Thank you so much. In the next episode of How I Masaba, I am speaking to the actor and global youth icon, Maitri Ramakrishnan. Tune in next week. You were listening to How I Masaba only on Luminary. How I Masaba is produced by Manisha Singhatyal and Rainshine Entertainment. Hrithika Bajaj is our creative producer and Palash Kulkarni is our executive producer. The research for this episode was done by Anushka Mukherjee. The mix engineer for this episode is Ankit Thakur. Artist management by Versus Entertainment, LLP. The music supervisor for the episode is Ankur Srivastav. The episode was recorded at Bayout Studios, Mumbai.